The last piece of the calculus of parametric curves is distance. I know the slopes of curves, I can calculate speed, but I would also like to know how far the curve has traveled. The first two problems were derivative problems. This last problem is an integration problem, like the distance traveled problem was in calculus one. The length of the curve is called arc length. Unsurprisingly, the arc length is going to be the integral of speed. In any reasonable system of motion, the integral of speed should be distance. In this case, the distance traveled by the moving particle described by the parametric curve. I know what speed is from the previous video, the square root of the squares of the two coordinate derivatives. So I integrate this in the time variable, and this will calculate the length of the curve over the domain of time from A to B. So let me start with a familiar circle. Here is the parametric description of the circle. I'll do one revolution, so t from 0 to 2 pi. Then I differentiate the two coordinates in t, of course. I square them and take the square root. The square root the square can be here <laughs> the square here is conveniently sine squared plus co squared, which simplifies to one. So this is the integral of constant one from zero to two pi, and the result of that is just two pi. As expected, the arc length, which is the length of the path, the circumference of the unit circle, is two pi. What if the movement is different around the circle? Here is one of the alternative parameterizations for the circle. This one goes three times as fast, but it only has a third of the time for its domain. If I repeat the same steps, I again get a sine squared plus cos squared in the integrand, and then that simplifies to three. Integrating three from zero to two pi over three gives three times two pi over three, which is again two pi. The alternate description again gives the circumference of the circle, two pi. The example of the circle brings up a very important theme. A parametric curve describes both a shape and a movement along that shape. There are some pieces of the description that are only about the shape, and some that are explicitly about the movement. I need to tell the difference between the two. The shape itself should not depend on the speed. Likewise, the length of the curve should not depend on the speed either. These properties are said to be independent of the parameterization. Slope is another of these. The slope is the same regardless of how fast the movement is along the curve. The speed, however, should depend on the details of the movement. And similarly, the acceleration, however that is calculation, calculated, should also depend on the movement. I'm not going to get into the details here, but a lot of energy is consumed in mathematics to prove that the intrinsic properties, shape, length, slope, are indeed independent of the parameterization. These proofs are important. I need to know that, regardless of the parameterization, the length calculation is reliable. I could prove that this definition of length that I've given is indeed independent of the parameterization if I want. I'm not going to do it here, but consult the notes if you want to see this proof. This is also an example of a very important pattern or archetype in mathematics. Many objects are described in multiple ways, like the multiple parameterizations for a curve. However, they have intrinsic properties, properties that should be the same for all possible descriptions. I need to choose a description to do the calculations, but then I have to prove that all descriptions will give the same answer. I have to prove independence from the description. This happens all the time in mathematics, and so parametric curves are a great first example of this pattern. Moving back to examples, I can calculate the length of one piece of the cycloid. I'll set a equals one to this, so the cycloid is just based on the circle of radius one. So I differentiate both of the components, square those derivatives, and put them inside the square root. Then I expand the first and simplify with one sine squared plus cos squared term simplifying to one. I get this integral. I can use a clever trig identity here. This is the half angle identity. By dividing the angle by, angle by 2 in both places, and then multiplying by 2, I can then replace 1 minus cos t with 2 sine squared t over 2. After using this identity, I get this integral. The square and the square root cancel, leaving absolute value. However, since the angle is t over 2, as the angle goes from 0, zero to 2 pi, the input from sine is only from 0 to pi, and sine is always positive on this range. So I can drop the absolute value and then just finish the integral 
The result is 8. The length of one arc of the cycloid, based on the circle of radius 1, is 8 units of distance. A very interesting example is the circumference of the ellipse. The circumference of the circle is well known and essentially defines the number pi. However, an ellipse is trickier. How to clearly express the circumference of the ellipse is a very old pro problem and one that was mostly unsolved for hundreds of years. An ellipse can be parameterized by putting numbers a and b into the parameterization of the circle. a and b will end up being the two semi-axis lengths of the ellipse how far out it goes in the x and y axes, respectively. If a and b are the same, this is a circle, otherwise it is an ellipse. For future reference, let me define a number e as the square root of a squared minus b squared over a. This is called the eccentricity of the ellipse. It is zero if the ellipse is a circle, and it grows up to one the narrower and narrower the, the ellipse becomes. Then I'll try to calculate the arc length. Well, I differentiate both coordinates and put the derivatives in the now familiar pattern for arc length. I'll use a clever trick here. I'll add and subtract a squared cos squared t inside the square root, and then I'll group the terms. The result leads to a sine squared plus cos squared, which simplifies to 1, and I can also pull a squared out by dividing by a squared in the remaining term, and this is the result of those algebraic manipulations. Now recall the eccentricity I defined. I can pull a out of the entire integral and replace this expression with e squared, the eccentricity squared. And the result is this integral. The problem here is that this integral is impossible, at least impossible with elementary functions. People trying to express the circumference of the ellipse using normal functions like trig, exponentials, polynomials, and so on will always fail. It can't be done. To integrate this, new functions need to be defined. This is a historically important example. The unsolvability of this integral was studied in the 18th and 19th centuries. New functions were defined to solve the integrals. These functions and their properties led to whole new geometries and a new type of object, an elliptic curve. Elliptic curves don't actually look anything like ellipses. They are called elliptic because they relate to the solution of the integral that describes the circumference of the ellipse. Elliptic curves in the 20th and 21st centuries have become one of their own well-developed branch of mathematics, and all of this arose from trying to deal with one particularly difficult arc-length integral, which is pretty fascinating.